Welcome back to the session. We had a most interesting session this morning, and we heard from two Japanese, one Korean, and one Chinese speaker. The session was moderated by Professor Lee Jong Ok. For this afternoon's session, we are thankful that Professor Andrew Aria will be moderator. Uh, Professor Andrew is a volunteer research consultant with NTFPEP Malaysia, which is a civil society organization based in Miri, Malaysia, working to conserve and rehabilitate forests, strengthen social forestry policy and practices to improve the livelihoods of indigenous Penang communities via non-timber forest products enterprise development. Professor Aria also leads a civic research based in Kuching, Malaysia. Established in 2018, Civica undertakes research, training, and advocacy activities in support of an alliance of local civil society groups to foster a culture of democracy and balanced development in Sabah and Sarawak. Professor uh, Aria also leads Civica research based in Kuching, Malaysia. As, uh, as uh, he also works to advance socio-political and economic reforms. He is an ARENA Fellow and an active member of Aliran, Malaysia's first multi-ethnic reform movement dedicated to justice, freedom, and solidarity. Additionally, he is an EXCO member of Pergerakan Tenaga Academic Malaysia which champions the welfare and rights of academics and works to reform tertiary education. He, he was associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations in the Faculty of Social Sciences of University Malaysia, Sarawak. So thank you very much, Professor Aria. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Kim Chi. That has been a very, that was a very kind introduction. I, I'd just like to say that I am also an ARENA Fellow, and I'm really privileged to have been a founding member of the Global uh, South, this Global South University. Uh, I've been associated with this South-South program for some years now, and I, I think it's a real privilege to chair today's uh, afternoon session. We had wonderful morning session and I hope we can continue to have wonderful discussions. Very, very interesting today. Uh, we are meeting in the context of global climate change. Uh, those are the big issues, global warming, and we already heard from this morning's uh, speaker, Hiki Dasan, about how climate emergencies and climate disasters are affecting farmers. The thing is that from these climate emergencies, the dominant economic paradigm, instead of addressing global climate change, seeks to make profit from global climate change. So they are looking to accumulate wealth, further wealth, not by reducing uh, carbon, uh, the carbon economy, but actually accumulating it by you know, talking about carbon capture, carbon storage, uh, alternative fuels like hydrogen, but not addressing the reduction of emissions. So in the process, nobody's talking about farmers. Indigenous people are forgotten. Uh, there's very little discussion on food security, uh, self-sufficiency. So in this context, our discussions in this South-South Forum, this 10th South-South Forum, uh, with the broad title of Thinking About New Horizons is very, very impo important. And today's discussions on rural regeneration in East Asia holds many, many lessons for all of us uh, in this part of the world. We share a common uh, history, we share a common uh, culture, we share a common food, which is rice. And that's really, really important. So to this afternoon, we have two speakers. We will have the first part of this afternoon session. We will have two very distinguished speakers. The first is Dr. Gu Jain. 
He is a Korean uh, scholar activist who has been involved in making village activities in Jinan County, Hongseong County. He has been in charge of social cooperatives in Chungnam province. He was invited as a presidential special committee member on the agricultural sector. Currently, he is the director of the Institute of ILSO Gongdo in Hongseong County. Currently, he is also the director, uh, sorry, he has published numerous books on making village activities, combining his practice and academic analysis. So that would be our contributor from Korea. We also have another distinguished speaker coming from China. She is Sitsui Jade Margaret. She is associate professor at the Institute for Rural Revitalization Strategy at Southwest University in China. She is also a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability. And she has been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China since the year 2000. So we have two very interesting speakers coming to talk about rural regeneration in the context of uh, an economic uh, model that has run away from the small farmers and the need to reconstruct our rural sector. So I pass first to Dr. Gu to present his uh, uh, input. Dr. Gu. Good afternoon. I'm a charger of the village. My name is Kutai. Today, I want to brief you about the village activities in Korea. To Hong Yo No, who has spoke in the morning, is one of the founders of our village. We built the village together. And here's my introduction. Our village is built centered around the Insokondo topic. This means that if we only work, we will be like a cow, which is useless. We have to learn and think. So the workers have to go to the village to experience by themselves and learn the knowledge. These are the experience of our institute. In 2015, we established our association. In 2016, we have prepared meetings and established our regional association. From January to June in 2017, we have built seminars and conferences. Over the processes, we have received many help and assistance from our partners. And we work on the building of the villages, not only on one or two programs, but on how to sustainably promote the building of the village. Because of this goal, we named our organization an association institute where not only the researchers participating, but also the local scholars and the local farmers can take part in. This picture is shown in Japanese. Let me explain in Korean.
we make agricultural production in villages and some agricultural activities. First, we should have some research and uh, research on the knowledges. on small villages and communities. Then we helped the local farmers to build their own business. These are all the things we have been doing over the years. So we have a monthly uh, seminar. Every month we will have this seminar and we will have two major conferences annually. Each one will last for 12 hours. And every two day, uh, every two months, we will have a workshop which will last for almost three days. We now have 244 members in our institute and 24 major members. We carried out many activities. We organize this institute, and I'd like to introduce you about our activities. I find profound meaning in our work. It is closely linked with the national development, but at the same time, there are some things that are very private to the local communities. From 1910 to 1945, during the Japanese colonial period, the community activities were oppressed in the name of suppressing independence movements. And during the division of Korea and the Korea War, the Korea War there emerged a red complex and a tendency for people to feel like they are going to prison. And then we have experienced rapid urbanization and national development. And in 1992 and 1995, we have delayed local autonomy, but seen as an achievement. So back then, the activists in rural construction will be caught into prison. There, are, there were many systems that are against the rural construction back then. So we have so those who advocate for the rural work would get hurt. So back then, the parents would tell their kids that if you go to the rural areas and work there, please do not go back to the cities or you would get hurt. Due to these historical reasons, we have different development in urban and rural areas. The urbanization was rapid and the rural areas are going to an urban direction. And the large production and the urban lifestyle has also have also been introduced to the rural areas. This is also closely linked with the government advised 
living style. In Korea, the urbanization is very rapid. Currently, our urbanization rate is 50%. However, the urbanization also led to many problems like the pollution, the wastes. It's very hard to manage these resources in rural areas and these wastes in rural areas. Even so, we have made huge efforts. Historically speaking, we also have a long history of rural construction. And there are many regional thinking or ideologies in the rural areas. For example, we have the independent movement. And there's such thinking. Our regional development is relatively slow. And the people in the rural areas think they should be the owners of the rural areas and promote the development of these villages. Therefore, they have a sentence which is to create our village. They voluntarily build their villages. And the people there guide this direction of rural construction. Therefore, the power from the primary level, the grassroots level in rural construction was very important. And this picture shows the history of our rural construction. We used to be like in Japan, there were division of the city, the rural areas, and the prefectures. Now we are in a difficult process of rural revitalization. With this kind of division structure, and we have, and some efforts went in vain. Compared with the rural areas in Japan, we have larger areas for rural areas. So it's hard for Korean people to conduct self-management in their rural areas because of the large area. And we are also different from the situation in China We have city, town, prefecture. And this area is a small scaled village. 
and this mean is compared with many more different villages. So I will just show you some pictures about this without more detailed description. In 1987, in 1987, the villagers won some improvements thanks to some conflicts and a campaign, but it still have a huge gap between villages and urban areas. So there's still many obstacles in the development of rural areas in South Korea. So when South Korea was tending to build the rural areas politically, we even strive harder to build the rural areas better. However, the spontaneous activities conducted by the indigenous people do only have a very, very limited impact. Nationwide, we have 38,000 small villages like this. Many indigenous people are still living there. So those group of people tend to build their home to a better place and they still stay at their hometown. Centered around their purpose, we have our campaign to renew, renovate, and govern our countryside. For those environmental governance, environmental management and treatment, we did a lot of efforts. We also tried a lot of ways to beautify the landscape, but the efforts of indigenous people are very limited. But we still have a lot of volunteers engaged in to do them on a daily basis, even though there's still a long way to go to actually realize a overhaul. So maybe today we couldn't sustainably do this work because of the lack of labor force and lack of strength. Additionally, in rural areas, there are a few young people living there. So our problem is to attract more young people from cities to return to the countryside. In countryside areas, it is not enough for us to support our own development only based on our production, especially those agriculture produce. So apart from our production, we should also do more direct marketing. So our production, marketing, and sales are all conducted all on, by ourselves. So we de develop on our own. And in the center of our village, we also establish some activities to improve the living quality and standard of our indigenous people, such as some charity programs and the facilities. However, our strength is one more time very limited. But our efforts never end. Therefore, more and more people are caring about what they can get after going back to the countryside because we have already attracted their attention. And actually, this part is closely correlated to the national policy 
which cannot be decided all by ourselves, such as the developers of the villages and the decision makers of the nation can decide what kind of favorable conditions can be provided for people coming back to the countryside. And in, for, in terms of education, we tend to expand the coverage of village education and how should we link our village elementary schools together with other middle schools. We still need a lot of work. And as you can see on this slide, it is a demonstration of our green sustainable development mode. And this mode is based on the market structure and the landscape of our villages. And it is just a very ideal mode and plan and cannot be fully implemented. That is very unfortunate. Environmentally friendly green sustainable development is our ultimate goal. So we have already began to make our own decisions on the main basis. And we will also report our regional policies to the nation to bridge the gap between the local governance and the national governance. And we believe the country can definitely do more support for the development of rural areas in Korea. We also believe that we should make better use of our plans and ask for more favorable conditions and decisions from the central government. In 2008, we conducted our first round of rural renewal and rural rebuilding. Back then, we held a general meeting and there is theme. As you can see on this slide, in every corner of the villages of South Korea, we conducted different and various kinds of activities to revitalize and renovate the rural areas of our nation. Meanwhile, we still believe that the indigenous people of those villages, their support matters most and their decision matters most. Looking into the future, it is quite hard for us to fully implement all our ideal plannings and we still have a very long way to go because the villages cover quite a huge area of land. And the villages structure are different. They need to be streamlined and be managed once again. So our plans should first rebuild our rural areas. That is our first goal and the first step. On the right of this slide, there are many grassroots proactive activities in supporting rural renovation and the regeneration. Because those villages cover a huge area of land, therefore, apart from the local indigenous people support, we also need many more support and help from the nation, from the academia, scholars, etc. But currently speaking, this committee, this grassroots organizations are not that optimized and cannot function that well. But fortunately, we have already begun and things will get better.
we also require some pillar organizations to offer us more assistance in doing so. Because looking back to the history of South Korea, the third party pillar support is very important as it used to be. And on this slide, I've shown you the mean based villages landscape and this location. In those villages, there are many favorable policies. The civil societies organizations are so few. And in the near future, we will try to organize the village residents to understand our mission and to help us do the work all together. And the third, In terms of administration, their support and the support of grassroots organizations and the support offered by the third parties, all very important. How could we make the best use of the support offered by the three parties and the three stakeholders? And how should we better pursue the development they are still in question. Therefore, with this kind of support offered by the grassroots organizations, the central administration and third party organizations, we can make the renovation better, and we can also do more activities and construction, and we can also ask for more support in terms of policy from the central government. And this task should be all should should be finished as soon as possible. Even though villages are conducting various activities in every corner of the villages all around South Korea, we still have problems. Those activities, those communications are not enough to build a better rural area in South Korea. So we try to make the use of internet connection. We try to resort to the internet to better develop the rural areas in South Korea. So as you can see, we start this work from the connection of the indigenous people in villages. They are the pioneers in this campaign. And my presentation will soon be concluded. The scenarios in all countries differ a lot, but our common goal is to renovate, revitalize our rural areas and the villages. And we also call for more cooperation among different regions for a better future for the villages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gu, for giving us a rather comprehensive historical perspective of the challenges and the tenacity of villages to organize themselves, and also of activists like you and others who worked with these villages, despite the difficulties, whether it was from 1910, under the Japanese colonial period, during the Korean War, and subsequently 
uh, in this modern era with rapid urbanization happening. Uh, the challenges continue, but the tenacity of the villages to continue to want to uh, own their lives and own their land and organize their lives and organize them, their societies. So thank you very much uh, for that comprehensive uh, presentation. Yeah, are there any questions, please, for Dr. Guja? If, um, if you can raise your hand or just type your questions in the chat box or, or even just uh, ask away. Anyone? If not, if there's none, we shall continue with the second presentation, which is uh, we shall now move on from Korea to China to see, uh, to have uh, Sitsui's uh, Margaret's presentation. Margaret, over to you. First, I would like to uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sitsui, and uh, my background actually is the overseas Chinese or Indonesia or overseas Indonesia Chinese. Uh, because in at, in the end uh, in the end of 19th uh, 20th century, my uh, grandparents uh, moved to Indonesia. However, uh, there's the uh, in uh, Indonesia uh, mass massacre happened in 1965. This is because of the uh, CIA and also in in Indonesia uh, military uh, plot the. Uh, coup d'etat. And at that time, the uh, land reform uh, were terminated. And uh, at that time, the uh, Indonesia also accept the uh, in industrial transfer from the uh, uh, Western countries, particularly uh, the US. Uh, so at that time, there's a very, uh, very strong anti-Chinese movement. And uh, my grandparents um, moved to uh, China. And so that uh, my parents uh, met in China and um, I was born in China. So uh, my, uh, my background actually is uh, uh, let, let me uh, to let, let me to revisit the uh, how the, um, the global south struggled to have a land reform. However, they fail. And another example uh, during the 1960s in uh, Brazil, the uh, the leftist oriental uh, uh, presidents uh, Jean Guha also uh, 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 tried their best to have the land um, reform. However, it's also um, terminated due to the CIA uh, inter in intervene and uh, the uh, land reform also uh, failed. And this uh, the fail of the uh, land reform or the fail of the land revolution is the, uh, the I think is the uh, background of why uh, the, uh, the peasants uh, of the global south still have to struggle for this, um, uh, the um, uh, land um, redistribution. And because it's uh, for us, has the uh, uh, Chinese, uh, as you know that uh, Chinese society has the long history of uh, small peasantry, at least uh, 4,000 years. And, uh, um, and then we find that uh, political, economic, and social stability depend largely on the majority of peasants have access to land resources. And every uh, very first national policy of the new dynasty was usually land redistribution and a tax uh, levy, Jun uh, Tian Mian Fu. So uh, we have to understand the uh, land reform is actually is very important to uh, political, economic, and social stability. And um, in terms of the um, uh, the question of uh, equality, um, uh, our the ancestor like Confucius also mentioned that the real evil is not scarcity, uh, scarcity and, uh, but, equal, but unequal distribution. I think this is the uh, wisdom of our, our um, ancestor. That means uh, once we have the uh, um, good and um, uh, e uh, with uh, good equality and um, 
uh, mean the, our society, if it's good, that means uh, we have the uh, very uh, fair land redistribution and our tax wavy. And also we can uh, have the eco uh, uh, access to land resources. And uh, I also want to uh, draw your attention to our, uh, wist our wist the wisdom of our ancestor, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the school, the Chinese school of uh, agriculture. Um, this is uh, quite, uh, red uh, quite radical. I think I would say that this is very radical. So uh, when compared with the uh, Confucius uh, theory, uh, uh, he, uh, Xu Xing actually is um, quite um, the representative of Chinese school of agriculture is uh, marginalized in the uh, mainstream mainstream um, discourse of um, in, 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 Chi in, in Chinese academia. And because uh, why is it so uh, radical? Because it's uh, um, stress that uh, wise people, including the elite, the emperor or the king, uh, that means the ruling class, should work on land and share food together with ordinary people. And another wisdom that uh, we have to revisit, particularly in crisis such as the uh, 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 COVID pandemic, uh, we also find that this wisdom, uh, the food and medicine are one. So on the other hand, we will emphasize the importance of uh, uh, ecological agriculture. And on the other hand, we also have to uh, revisit our the uh, traditional uh, Chinese medicine. And um, in uh, today China, we um, have uh, more or less um, stability because uh, we have the uh, land revolution in 1949. So the majority are the um, small, how would say that these small landholders. And, uh, but as you know that the, we maintain the uh, collective uh, ownership of land. That means uh, each uh, person uh, or uh, has the access to the land resources. However, uh, uh, the land is not for sale in the market. And uh, you will find that uh, we still, for the uh, self over uh, 70 years, the Communist Party of China uh, maintained this kind of uh, old traditional uh, uh, small peasantry system. And um, in today's China, uh, um, we still have 2.5 million villages. Uh, we maintain collective land ownership and we have uh, uh, over 230 million peasant households. So uh, China, I would say that uh, is a big country, uh, but we maintain small uh, peasantry with uh, thousands of years of history. And uh, for most of the, um, uh, uh, the majority of the peasant, even they uh, go to the city, however, more or less they will uh, maintain or uh, to their, state, their status uh, has a um, peasant household because it means they still have uh, the con con contracted land and also housing land. Um, they will say that we have land at home village. No matter we go to the city or return at home, we still have our base. And, um, and uh, the uh, Chinese government also the promote uh, the, uh, the policy of rural revitalization. And the, uh, one of the key uh, element is to renew peasants' rights of land use for 30 more years. I think this is uh, uh, the basic element of the uh, rural vitalization. Uh, that means uh, uh, to secure the majority of peasants still have access to land resources. And of course, uh, the background is uh, we have to tackle the problem of industrial overproduction and financial instability, particularly uh, of these two main problems, uh, uh, the Chinese government and also the uh, Chinese society. We also uh, struck, uh, work together to keep the uh, small peasantry and rural uh, communities uh, 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 continuous. And um, we have a, a research team under the supervision of Professor Wen Tejin. And uh, based on our resources, uh, China has 10 
uh, uh, started called uh, economics for over 70 years. However, we still have uh, uh, more or less a social stability because uh, we can maintain the uh, brutal communities uh, continues to uh, to solve those uh, problems created by the uh, modernization and industrialization and even the uh, the speedy uh, financialization. And this book is a uh, free download, so uh, you are welcome to download this book from the uh, Global U uh, website and also the um, the Stranger uh, website. Uh, the title. Uh, is a uh, uh, 10 crisis to the political economy of China's development from 1949 to 2020. And uh, the uh, con one concluding remarks from that book is, uh, in China's uh, 75 years history of industrialization and financialization, it is observed that as a rule, as a rule, whenever the cost of price could be transferred to rural sector, capital in intensive urban industry sector would achieve soft lending and the existing institution would be maintained. Once not transferable to the rural sector, the price took a hard landing in the urban sector. Consequently, major reforms in fiscal and even economic system were incurred. And um, in uh, whenever we have crisis, uh, those, uh, the, uh, the solution is how can to uh, shift the um, urban uh, population, particularly the, um, the urban youth, uh, move to the uh, countryside. And we have this uh, very uh, um, good example because during the Cultural Revolution, there are um, send, uh, there was uh, ways sending the um, uh, young uh, generation, the urban youth to the uh, countryside during the 1960, 1968, and even 1964. And nowadays, you know that uh, we, have, uh, we have to confront the US sanction and US attack. And uh, the, uh, the Chinese government has the policy of the uh, double uh, the circulation. Uh, that means uh, in, internal uh, circulation and an international circulation. That means we have to, to think about how can we shift the uh, export-oriented economy and how to strengthen the rural economy. And in that sense, the rural revitalization is the utmost important policy of the Chinese government. And uh, for the past 10, over uh, 10 years, Chinese government has invested a lot of money for the uh, new infrastructure projects, uh, such as the uh, roads, internet, and the um, uh, uh, transportation, computer centers, uh, uh, among others. But I think the most important has uh, the um, uh, the uh, speakers in uh, in the morning as um, uh, point out that uh, how let the uh, the young generations uh, uh, love to stay in the village and how can we repair our relationship with the earth. And um, another example, uh, how wise the uh, rural community is so important. Uh, this, uh, for example, uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the uh, more than 30 million migrant rural workers uh, out of that, at that time, they, lose the, they lost their job and they can immediately return to their uh, home village. So uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, official uh, statistic, we find that the, uh, urban, the, the rate of urbanization is also very high in China, over uh, 60 or uh, the over 70%. However, due to the uh, land re revolution, this the floating uh, uh, population, that means the uh, rural migrant workers, they can uh, return to their home village and also they can uh, go uh, uh, go to the city again. This kind of the floating uh, uh, population is still exists and they are very, uh, there is a very big uh, number. However, um, we uh, from the, um, the perspective of um, um, at, at a scholar edifice for the uh, rural regeneration, we hope that um, the uh, how can we strengthen the uh, rural, rural communities and let the uh, the young generation continues to have a stable life in the countryside.
And um, uh, as you all know that uh, in the wealth system, um, uh, most of the uh, countries of the uh, global south actually um, exploit our uh, neighbor and also resources for the core countries, particularly the Western countries, uh, Europe and also uh, Japan. And so how we can change this uh, the wealth system. That means how can we delay from this uh, uh, the U.S.-led uh, international order and also to strengthen the uh, people-centered uh, development project. And um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yan Xiaohui and, and, and I are all involved in the rural reconstruction movement uh, in today China. However, uh, uh, if we have a historical uh, perspective, we know that this uh, movement uh, start in the uh, early 19, uh, early uh, 20th centuries. At that time, our senior also have already faced the problem of the rural destruction. So that's why the movement is named the rural regen uh, re reconstruction or regeneration, because at that time the rural society has already been destroyed. Um, and this um the project of uh, or the movement uh, rural reconstruction is to uh, is a response to problems caused by industrialization and modernization uh, in uh, all in the in developing country is in, in China, and uh, that this movement the main idea or the main goal is to defend the peasant communities and agricultures. And however, this movement always. Uh, will uh, separate from or parallel or in tension with the with the projects initiated by the state or by the political uh, parties. And from this uh, picture, we, we, we find that our senior like Yang Shuming and Yan Yang Chu during the uh, 19, uh, uh, seven, uh, 1930 to 1940s, they already start many uh, projects to strengthen the uh, rural societies. Uh, even after the uh, Communist Party uh, took power, however, they still do what they are, uh, um, they have to uh, work hard to uh, uh, to promote the uh, uh, peasants' uh, rights and also uh, organize many comprehensive activities like the uh, literacy campaign and strengthen the uh, importance of science and technology uh, to improve the water uh, uh, conservation, the uh, irrigation, and also to uh, set up the uh, peasant uh, co-ops for the health and also for the uh, finance uh, uh, credit. And uh, from this, uh, you, you find that uh, one picture uh, particularly uh, emphasized the the um, the example of the uh, barefoot uh, uh, doctors. Uh, barefoot doctors means uh, they are farmers and uh, at the same time they are also the uh, local doctors. I think this uh, tradition also help us how can we uh, to avoid or to encounter crisis uh, such as, uh, for example, recently in uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I will explain a little bit more later. And uh, in uh, the uh, early uh, 21st century, uh, we has uh, initiated new uh, rural regeneration movement. And uh, we have to set up the uh, James Yance uh, Rural uh, Re Reconstruction Institute in uh, North China. At that time, uh, Dr. Yan is the first uh, batch of the uh, students in that uh, institute. And at that time, we promote the uh, all grow ecology and sustainable uh, rural society. Uh, I stress the importance of agroecology because it's uh, the big difference from the uh, from our uh, senior. Because at that time they uh, they emphasize the cooperation and amongst the uh, peasants. However, uh, for our mission, uh, we have to um, emphasize the importance of the agroecology. And um, apart from the uh, 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 to support uh, or uh, echo to uh, official pro rural uh, policy, uh, however, we particularly we facilitate uh, many activities to help the peasants have their own organizations and groups. 
And this picture show that uh, we also mobilize many uh, young people, particularly uh, university uh, students to work on the land and also to have home visits and uh, to help the uh, person set up their own cooperatives and also organize an um, uh, international um, forum uh, to facilitate the exchange between uh, India and also China. At that time, we have uh, the uh, International uh, Rural Reconstruction Forum exactly in the village. And of this picture also so that uh, we have many uh, experience, for example, to promote the eco uh, agriculture and also the architecture uh, the, uh, we uh, have the experiment of community, university, and peasant training. We set up the uh, surprise and marketing cooperatives, and uh, we set up, uh, we help the peasant to set up the uh, elderly and women association to uh, uh, organize the cultural performance. And also we emphasize the uh, cultural uh, performance and to uh, organize many uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, workers uh, migrant uh, uh, cultural activities uh, uh, conscious in the villages and also uh, to organize some of the uh, medical services for the uh, local villages. And uh, this picture show that the uh, uh, how can we uh, promote the ecological agriculture with the local uh, the uh, materials? It's also the uh, build up the uh, eco toilet, uh, build it with the um, uh, local uh, uh, materials, and also how to waste pick in an ecological way. And this is the uh, eco architecture pictures, which is a cooperation between the uh, Taiwanese uh, architect and uh, local uh, villages. And uh, 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 in 2008, uh, we set up the, uh, the lead to doggy farm in suburb uh, Beijing. And this picture shows that uh, how can we facilitate the um, uh, exchange between the uh, uh, urban uh, people and also the uh, local villages. We organize many uh, organic farmers uh, market. And I agree that the uh, um, um, uh, uh, Korean speaker mentioned that uh, there is no more the, uh, the distinction between the um, uh, the uh, peasants and or the uh, food grower and also a uh, consumer. And exactly this is what uh, our ancestor promote. That means uh, everybody should be a food grower. This is the basic uh, requirement if you are a Chinese or if you are uh, human beings. And that means uh, we, uh, what we have done is to, to revive our, uh, the ancestor wisdom. And this picture shows that the uh, cultural activities in the little donkey farm. And uh, we also provide the uh, training program for the university student. They can have this uh, internship in uh, the, the little donkey farm. And uh, uh, we um, uh, echo the principle of the so-called uh, yi dong liang ai. That means uh, we, you have to uh, one knowledge about the agriculture, of course, the ecological uh, agriculture, and two loves. That means you love your home home village, you love your uh, village uh, villager uh, fellows, and also you love the earth. And uh, we also send many uh, university students to the uh, countryside to do the home visits, to let them understand what happened uh, in the countryside and uh, how also to uh, uh, unlearn their uh, knowledge. As you know that we all the, uh, uh, the products of the um, uh, industrialized uh, uh, um, school system. That means what we have learned actually is to support the uh, uh, capitalist uh, development. So how can we uh, to unlearn our uh, knowledge to understand the reality in the countryside is very important. And, um, and this uh, picture so that the uh, young people try to set up a uh, youth commune and they learn how to raise a um, pig how to, um, to understand the traditional uh, uh, handicraft, like uh, paper cuttings, how to grow uh, wheat, and how to do the uh, sesame and manufacturing uh, uh, process. So all this, that means uh, the, uh, young, uh, the young people have to relearn again and again. And this is picture so that the, they, after they, the training program, they go back to their home region, they have to their experiment. So uh, 
And um, this is another new campaign that means the uh, Loving Home Village. That means uh, we try to, uh, to identify uh, many local villages. They have already done a lot of work to uh, love their home village, to uh, strengthen their um, home village and the, uh, to let the beauty of their home village uh, be visible. So we, that means we have to uh, build up a new uh, networking to uh, uh, between uh, among those uh, peoples who can share our vision. And one of the example is Yang Zhengxi from uh, uh, Guizhou. Uh, she, he comes from a, a small minorities ethnic groups and he uh, tried to keep the old seeds of his uh, home villages. He built up a seed uh, muse museum to uh, keep the oasis of uh, rice and uh, also to um, set up to help the uh, local villages to set up a cooperatives to revive the uh, traditional uh, agriculture. That means to uh, take care, to uh, work together with the cows. So I uh, echo what uh, the uh, Korean uh, speaker uh, mentioned that we should learn how to, uh, to, um, to feed the cows. This is also the basic requirement if you want to be a, a Chinese or you, if you want to be a human being in the 21st century. And uh, this is picture so that uh, is very uh, beautiful uh, pictures and also attract a lot of the uh, tourists from the, uh, uh, from the uh, cities and they have to this experience. Of course, uh, we have also to, uh, to aware um, how can this kind of uh, consumerism and also the capital, uh, they won't be uh, the, uh, exploit the, uh, the countryside again. And that means uh, it is so important. How can the uh, local peasants organize uh, themselves and have the uh, negotiating power to negotiate with the uh, outsider? And um, this is another new program. The, that means the uh, village song projects. That means the uh, the cultural teams, the cultural media teams, work together with the local villages to uh, produce a new songs to uh, understand their uh, the uh, significance of their villages, their um, beauty of their villages, and they work together to produce uh, songs. That means uh, we have to uh, work. Uh, work with them, but through the uh, cultural transformation, through the uh, songs, uh, making songs, and, and how to, uh, to do the uh, social transformation through the cultural uh, transformation uh, first. And, uh, and I also want to draw your attention to the uh, revival of traditional Chinese medicine. As I mentioned, food and uh, medicine are one. And this, is, and this wisdom is very important, particularly we have a pandemic. Uh, we never overcome pan, uh, COVID pandemic. We are still in uh, the COVID pandemic. We haven't uh, overcome. And uh, based on our experience, we learned a lot of lessons, how to revive the uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine. And uh, we have very good uh, effects if you take uh, Chinese uh, medicine. And apart from the, uh, the Chinese uh, TCM, and also we have many uh, Chinese um, uh, health, health the, uh, practice like uh, acupuncture, uh, massage, and also the um, uh, mug uh, uh, the uh, method. All this uh, traditional uh, wisdom help us to overcome the uh, COVID-19. And uh, these two package is the uh, China, uh, TCM, the Chinese uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, capsules. And uh, all this uh, method, uh, once again, uh, to uh, let us uh, revisit the, uh, the wisdom of our ancestors and also remind us to uh, continue or to revive and also to carry on their wisdom. Uh, all our wisdom, I would say that. So the principles, uh, according to the philosophy of TCM, that means uh, this is uh, to prevent the occurrence or develop or uh, recurrence of disease. That means uh, before you uh, get disease, you already have uh, preventive uh, precautions and also preventive measures. This is the wisdom. 
And also, of course, uh, is also co is is also uh, the logic is also against the capital capital capitalism because uh, in uh, many uh, uh, communities provide free TCN shoe, and this is exactly against the cap the logic of capital because as you know that is the capital logic is based on the profit. That means how can we resist the uh, the profit the logic of profit making or money oriented uh, uh, culture, and uh, uh, do, uh, in, uh, in, uh, during the pandemic, over now the lock the village uh, lockdown is quite pop was quite popular because uh, uh, due to the land uh, revolution, that means uh, every peasant household has access to land, their house. That means they have the security of food and also the social spacing. And I think we have should learn uh, should should keep uh, should keep this lesson and. Because uh, we, I think we have to uh, uh, to encounter the pandemic one again and again. Uh, because according to some uh, the uh, scientists, because the uh, the uh, virus and also COVID is uh, manufactured, and so and the big farm also make profits from this kind of uh, manufacturing virus. So that means uh, we have to prepare ourselves to face the. Uh, the pandemic again and again. And in terms of the uh, course, uh, uh, one treatment for TCM is only uh, 100 uh, renminbi, that means uh, US dollar 15. But if you take uh, Western medicine, it's uh, 530 US dollar, it's about uh, renminbi 3,550. So this is a huge gap of uh, profit between what if you take a uh, Ting Fei Pai Du declaration, or uh, you take a uh, price price uh, price and uh, according to statistics, uh, the uh, the global farm industry actually earn a lot a big uh, profit in two thousand twenty two. The Pfizer has uh, the profit uh, earned the profit over one hundred billion US dollar. I think uh, maybe we all contribute this kind of uh, 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 one, 100 uh, billion US dollar, uh, the profit making industry. So um, um, uh, because of time limits, uh, we don't uh, go into the his history of uh, how TCM were suppressed uh, by the Western medicine. And of course, uh, our the agriculture, small peasantry also suppressed by the modernized agriculture. So at that time, uh, on the one hand, our the uh, the young generation is no more uh, love uh, the uh, agriculture. That means the peasants, the number of peasants de is declining. We try to uh, we we what we we'll try to encourage, right? On the other hand, those TCM number, uh, the practitioner TCM practitioner. The number of P uh, TCM petition also declining is uh, less than the um, ten percent. So this is our mission. How can we uh, encourage more young uh, generation to become food grower and also TCM practitioner? Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. What an interesting presentation. Uh, although it was a bit fast, so I hope other people could follow your very interesting presentation. <clears throat> um, I'm intrigued. I was quite happy to see your Lianhua Jingwen capsules uh, shown there. Uh, it was used very, very widely in Southeast Asia for, by many, both as a preventive as well as a curative medication for alternative medicine for COVID. I myself was taking the Lianhua Qingmen capsules when I had COVID. So it was very interesting, it was very, very uh, effective. But thank you for giving us a very comprehensive um, uh, overview of the Chinese uh, uh, what is it, peasant farming sector, uh, the efforts at maintaining the sector in China uh, from history. What's also very interesting is how you linked your personal family history uh, uh, to that of the rural sector, how your grandparents went to Indonesia, but then left and returned to China. And there in China, um, you know, got involved in 
land uh, <coughs> resettled in China because of their ability to get land. I think a very important difference between the Chinese experience and I think nearly every other country's experience um, is the fact that in China, households maintain their land holdings. Uh, I mean, they don't maintain it as their personal land holdings, but they have access to land through collective ownership. Uh, this is not the case in other countries where instead of looking at the rural sector as contributing towards the overall development of the country, the rural sector is seen as the backward sector that has to be developed or at least is used to provide resources into the industrial sector. So I think that is the big difference in a lot of our countries where policies are quite different uh, and which leads to a different set of results. Anyway, any questions for Margaret, please? I think in the chat, there were some questions, if I could read those questions. Um, Nicholas Muja from Malaysia says, national governments are emphasizing mega approaches to food production to feed increasing population worldwide. Um, <clears throat> this is clear when we have uh, giant agro-food uh, industries mass producing industrial food for an industrial world. Nicholas's question is how much does this policy affect um, uh, organic based farming and competing land uses? So maybe this is the first question for both of the speakers. I, I answer first. Yes, please. Uh, okay, please. yeah. And, um, and Actually, uh, the uh, proportion of the organic agriculture in China is very low, less than 10%. However, the uh, uh, Chinese government uh, encouraged the um, eco uh, agriculture. And all, uh, in, uh, in 2007, we also have the uh, slogan or the principle of ecological civilization. So that means the uh, the Chinese government has already uh, to uh, shift the direction to the ecological civilization, ecological uh, agriculture, and however, uh, the um, the uh, how I say it, the the uh, the societies is not yet uh, um, shift to this uh, direction, and um, in many cases, that's uh, they still. Uh, trapped in the uh, mentality of modernization. That means they believe in the uh, modernized agriculture and even uh, monocultural. So many villages like to uh, plant only one type of uh, fruit, for example, cash crop, an orange or a kiwi or a tea. So um, that's just, uh, I think in terms of the culture, this is a uh, uh, very, um, difficult to uh and can't to to overcome so um we, we need to uh, how i say that means we need to uh change our young uh, people and also to uh, pers persuade those already uh, have the lesson of failure in uh that they already have the failure in um to uh to have this experience of the uh more the, modernized uh, the experiment to to uh, to have uh, uh, involved in the uh, one uh, cash crop. Thank you, Margaret. That yeah. seems to, that seems to be the case in many other countries. Where yes, they... um, even though uh, we have the uh, uh, land uh, revolutions, and uh, sometimes uh, they uh, also believe this kind of uh, uh, myth uh, of modernization. So they believe that uh, uh, large scale modernized agriculture is the best. Yes. And but but they you know that the, the price is controlled by the uh, international market. So mm -hmm. how can to change their mentality? Don't believe the international market because it's dominant, not by you. Yeah. And also the monoculture is uh is really bad for the soil. So they have to. Uh, have many problems about the disease. This is another problem of the chemical agriculture. So how can we critique the myth of uh, 
large-scale modernized agriculture, uh, chemical agriculture, mono agriculture? This is the fundamental question. And I think also sometimes when government policy promotes agriculture, uh, there are no alternatives for a lot of farmers, small farmers, subsistence farmers who don't know what is better, so they just believe government. So that is where a lot of our, you know, like your rural reconstruction movement, the the institutes uh, and the village uh, village uh, community set up by Dr. Ga, uh, Jai, Dr. Gu Jain, and also like this morning the experiences from Korea and Japan, um, that's very helpful. And Dr. I would Gu, like to uh, yes. add one sentence because uh, uh, we of course we persuade uh, peasants to thrive. Huh? from chemical agriculture to ecological agriculture is also very difficult for them because yeah. they are yeah. the bottom. Um, so we also want the uh, government to uh, invest a lot for this uh, transformation and uh, yeah, to, sk to skill the basic, the basic uh, uh, how I say, the basic course for this uh, transformation. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Gu, would you like to add anything? Food is the top priority for the people, so food is very important. So the peasants as in the bottom of the society, they cannot shift to the optimized type of agriculture all on their own. So they need the assistance offered by policies and the governments. We cannot emphasize the yield merely. We also need to focus on the training, education, and the guidance of the peasants living in the rural areas in terms of agricultural methods and skills. Besides, we should also focus on the quality of our food and the products. Because the price of good is set in the international market. So the organic agriculture needs many more subsidies and investments made by the government and the state. We need more training institutions and programs to popularize the strengths and advantages of organic agriculture for our patents. And we should look after the policies of the nation and we can do the things step by step. We should be we people need to oriented. Put people in the center. Of course, we cannot deny the marketing pricing. We need to guarantee the competitiveness and the food safety in the market pricing. Of course, some people think that the organic methods have low productivity. From my perspective, organic methods means no fertilizers, no chemicals in farming. Without these chemical fertilizers, it has benefit for human health and it can guarantee the food safety. In safeguarding people's health, I give full support in organic farming methods. The cost of organic farming methods is very high. So the cost is very high. 
and much higher than the non-organic methods. So we cannot only consider it in terms of the prices and the costs. And I hope we can get some ideas from the from our discussion and contribute it into the popularizing of the organic methods to bring more benefits to human health. It's important to have the sound value. And that is our first step in the work. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Hyung Rojo. Um, would there, is there, are there any other questions from, from the participants for Margaret and Dr. Gu? <laughs> or Dr. Ju also. If not, there was a, a, a contribution from India. I think Edwin John said that he was impressed by the presentation on South Korea's focus on mobilizing the grassroots. And he has mm -hmm. some literature uh, from India. He calls the approach neighborocracy or governance from below. He's willing to send copies of his material to anyone if you would like some. Uh, his email is in the chat. So please look at the chat if you want to see some experiences from India. You can just email Edwin. Uh, we've had some very, very rich discussions today. Uh, and I'm sure we have questions to talk, uh, some questions to raise with all the speakers. You see all the five speakers here. Um, we apologize with for Mr. Ono Kazuki, he's, he's not able to join us this afternoon. Um, if he can, he will switch on, and if not, he will not be able to. But uh, some questions, anybody would, would anybody like to raise some questions? If not, I have questions. I have lots of questions. Anybody from, from our, our uh, participants? If not, may I address my first question to uh, Hikita Mitsuoka. Uh, Ms. Hikita, um, the challenges of living in a small farmer cooperative, um, I'm sure that has been difficult, but was this experience something you learned by yourself or did you have exchanges with other similar experiments in different parts of the world to learn from them? Our organization is relatively small. It's a traditional rural community. But our value is not that old. We have many members from other parts of the world. So our value is new and inclusive. Another thing, is that we are a very formal and equal community. We contribute the equal amount of bounds. We take part in the activities together. For example, in our agricultural production, we have discussions and conferences. We have many uh, women members. And we also talk about many family issues between wives and husbands. We have many female members, so we chat and we work together and build our organization together.
A thing I want to point out is responsibility. We may have different opinions, but we always stick to our work. We are a small organization, but we are very equal. We are equal in salary, even though it is not very high, but equality is vital to us. So we can address many challenges this way. We have a lot of women, so in the processing work, we can do a lot of processing work in buying village. And processing work is exactly our women's advantage, such as making kimchi, making, making some sauces, soybean sauces. They are the heritage and the legacy passing on from our ancestors, grandmas to our generation. So we are doing what we are good at. We exchange our wisdoms, exchange our skills and thoughts. So we are doing quite well all together. In our little organization, we have some local people, we have some migrant people, we also have some male members here. And from a external perspective in our organization, our majority is the elderly female members and the male members are those who are in charge of us, but we still have to face a lot of problems and address them efficiently. So that is our experience and story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hikita. Um, my next question is really for Mr. Ju hyung -ru. Mr. Ju, I had a private communication from someone saying that your village farm um, was very, very impressive and we should go and learn from you. We, we who have no such experience should go and learn from you. So my question for Mr. Ju and also for Professor Yang and, and Margaret is, are you aware that while you are creating these wonderful experiences, it's very rich experiences in East Asia, that there are many parts other parts of Asia that are willing to, to learn from your experience. And are you aware that they are being left behind in terms of, of their own experience? And how can we bridge this gap between say countries that are not in East Asia, whether it is in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Timor. How do we bridge this gap? Is there any way we can think of uh, joint solidarity uh, workshops, trainings, study visits. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, seminar today where we are learning just through the Zoom, such experiences. But what have you ever thought about in your own context, how to share this with a larger community? So maybe with, we start with Mr. Ju and then we go around the table. Well, let me begin. We are now doing so well because in each country, we have our own good story, our good experience. So in terms of rural regeneration, we have a lot of good stories from all kinds of countries. And we have gained and accumulated experience for as long as eight decades. Yes, I admit that there's huge gap in wealth among Asian countries. So for those underdeveloped countries, we can support them in terms of food supply and do not let their people suffer from starvery. So for those underdeveloped countries, we welcome people from those areas to come to our countries and to learn from our experience. We can share with them our food and we can also 
have good communication with them, we can also keep contact with them. And we can offer them some suggestions on agriculture methods and skills. And we can offer them some science-based agricultural systems to improve their yield and also to help them safeguard their food security and food safety. Additionally, we also want to keep an online contact with those assistance receivers. Thank you, Mr. Zhu. Professor Yan, would you like to comment? I saw your hand was up just now. I will give you a brief response to that question. Me together with Professor uh, Judd Margaret and Jian Zhi, we did a lot of research in Thailand, Indonesia, and many countries in East Asia. Actually, we are very willing to know what is happening in those countries. We want to learn from them, learn from the indigenous people's experience. Because when talking about rural regeneration, we are not making comparison of development and we do not compare our economy, our income. It is an opportunity for us to seek for the methods to sustain development and the sustainable production in all kinds of countries. For example, in the end of last year, we went to Indonesia and that country has left me a very strong impression that society can do very well in maintaining equality and it can do better than China in doing so. Economically speaking, Indonesia is not that developed in terms of economy. There's huge wealth gap in those country, but in Indonesia, it is a highly eco society and those farmers can rely on themselves and produce foods on their own. And in this term, they can do better than China society. And even though in many rural areas of Indonesia, they still enjoy a very high yield in their farmland and their price, sales price of food can perform better than China's price. So I think based on our research, we found that there are many facts that we do not know before. So we do not pursue a higher yield or some science-based technologies to improve our income. What we are seeking for is to find some methods to sustain our development and to maintain our agricultural production for a long time rather than being destroyed by modernization process. So here is my response to your question. Thank you very much. Margaret, would you like to comment? Because China has a very different policy from many, many other countries. Um, would you like to comment about how you can share that across borders and yeah. if others could learn from your experience. Um, I was I would say that uh, I try to be not a China centered person. And I uh, learned from um, many uh, friends in different parts of the world. Um, for example, I remember in 2008, I uh, was the visiting professor of Sun Gong Hui in Seoul. Andrew was also the uh, visiting professor. And I um, uh, visit the, um, a village in, um, in, in South Korea. And um, I remember that um, the uh, farmer already uh, 40, 40 years something. 40 or 50 or 40 years something. And he told me he was the uh, the youngest in the village. And um, he told me he was an um, activist or a student um, protester during the mm -hmm. um, student movement. But uh, one day he thought that uh, if you uh, uh, demonstrate on the street every day, you are feel very tired and finds the uh, no hope or uh, no future 
on the street. So he uh, went back to his village and become, and become the leader of the farmer group. And I still remember he told me, um, you produce a lot of cell phone, Samsung, yeah, because that was very famous, very good, very smart. But he told me, you can't eat cell phone. Yeah. <clears throat> so I still remember his wisdom, right? And uh, of course, uh, it's also because why he can uh, went back to his village. I think it's also because the land uh, distribution allowed him to, uh, to have opportunity to go back to his village. And of course, uh, he, uh, he don't, he, and another, uh, the point is he tried to uh, make a proposal to go to the uh, Cuba. Because you know that it's a uh, very, very uh, difficult because uh, South Korea don't, uh, does, does not have the uh, a relation with uh, Cuba. However, he, uh, he know that because the uh, organic agriculture is very famous in Cuba. You, you know that the, the, the background because of the, um, the oil crisis, they shift to uh, organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he spent uh, three to four years to fill up the application to ask the government to uh, get some funding to go to Cuba and to learn and also to import the um, uh, the uh, chewing uh, swarm yeah, uh, for the uh, soil improvement. So um, I, I, from him, uh, from his story, I learned that first uh, a cell phone is not food. And, and um, the food uh, is the solution. And how can you uh, to understand uh, how can you produce food? Food is the, our, how I say, the, the dignity and also the future. And also the uh, uh, Cuba, maybe the other, that means you have to reach out the uh, imagination to reach out, to uh, learn from the other. Even Cuba, maybe so called the uh, socialist, right? I think in South Korea discourse, Cuba is a uh, evil, right? It's the uh, communist uh, evil, something like that. But how can you, uh, uh, to, um, how do you, to, to reach out, even you have very limited resources? Cuba, I think, is a uh, other, I think, is uh, that means how can you um, understand your context? and also to, uh, to do something to reach out within very limited resources. Uh, this is what I learned from uh, Korean um, farmers. And from a Japanese farmer, I know that uh, during the, uh, they are the, I would say that they are the pioneer of against uh, develop, developmentalism because I know there's a very strong movement, uh, Sanrijika movement and Minamata, uh, an event because one is the against the uh, airports they confisc confiscate the uh, the uh, peasants land right without their uh, uh, the uh, consensus and also this movement uh, lasts for over thirty years and still have uh, one or two families have as I know they still against they still on that uh, land. I, I think uh, 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 Hikita may, may provide some latest information. But I find, but, uh, but from their story, I find that how can they, uh, the title with the soil is so strong. Even you are the only one, you are alone, you still fight for the land. This is the insistence or the, um, how I say, the um, resilience that we have to learn from uh, the Japanese farmer. And for the, um, the souls, they are the, the first, I would say that uh, the first, at least the first generation uh, starting from 1962 against the, the environmentalism. Airport is not the, is not the everything. Yeah, but for us, uh, we, 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 fried, we um, went to Tokyo. We chose, yeah, right, the, you know that. But once you land on uh, the, the Tokyo, the um, Narita Airport, 
uh, is um is the just the background of the narrator about this the um the struggle of the Sanrijika. So I always have this kind of mixed feelings when I uh, have a chance to uh, go to the Tokyo. And for the Minamata, I never visit um, Minamata, but I know that they are the victim of the uh, chemical industry. Of course, the Bopa in, in India too. So uh, how we can, I would say that this is their tragedy, but how can we avoid or to uh, reflect on this uh, tragedy of uh, developmentalism. And um, I also visit the, um, the Brazil and uh, the, 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 for the, uh, the next year will be the 40 years anniversary of land struggle. They, uh, what they did is different from the last century, no more armed struggle. However, they did the, uh, they always do the land occupation and uh, they still fight for the uh, land uh, redistribution. And of course, uh, people-centered uh, and also agroecology. They put a lot of uh, elements more, not only the uh, change of the property relation. And of course, uh, not only the, uh, the, the so-called the uh, landless uh, urban people, but also indigenous people. So this, uh, they, 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 they told us that uh, every day is a war. So, they never, they never stop the uh, suffering. So um, in, in that sense, I think uh, we, we, it, I, would, I won't say that uh, on behalf of the uh, Chinese um, uh, farmers, but as a uh, Chinese, oh, I would like to be organic intellectuals. So uh, I would uh, to, uh, how I say, to provide the um, intellectual weapons. That means based on the historical research, and um, our the um, research, the not only with historic, not only the research, recent research, but also historical review. The uh, our solution is the uh, small peasantry and uh, to strengthen the rural uh, communities. This is our route. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Margaret. There's a lot in what you said. Um, before we picked it up, Dr. Gu. Would you like to add something to this international dimension of your work? In Because part of the problem is the propaganda of the world today is industrialization is the best thing. It's the, the, it's the dream of every society. And because we are so focused on industrialization, we are forgetting our roots in the rural area, the food production. Um, I think this is an international problem. Would you like to comment about, you know, if your um, experience in Korea, uh, if you are aware of other village making activities in other parts of the world, and if there's any uh, possibility of sharing that experience? Okay, here are my takeaways. We are living in different countries. And in our development process, we have experienced capitalism and com uh, com uh, competitiveness. We all been there, but who will dominate this process? And this will determine the different results. Is it dominated by the country, the government or the grassroots? So the direction is very important. Different direction will lead to different results. Another thing is about economic growth. We all have the same goal in economic growth. We hope that the agriculture, the farms, the farmers to grow. However, in the economic growth, they are harmed in some way. So in economic growth, the countries should adopt appropriate policies. Third, they need to adopt appropriate 
agricultural strategies according to the local situations. Besides, we cannot give too many, attach too many importance, too much importance to the strategies. In the long term, we cannot force the government policies. So it is very skillful to take the appropriate measures. Then it will become a good circle, which will benefit the local communities. Japan is just like any other countries. We sometimes follow the government policies. Sometimes we also make some regulations according to local circumstances. This is also one of my research topic. We have long-term exchanges for four decades and we have the mutual visits and exchanges and communications. And in 2017, China's team have come to Korea for communication. Therefore, these communications are very helpful and we hope there will be more in the future. Through this kind of communication, we can gain knowledge and we hope we can have once every year at least. This is very effective. And we hope we can have more offline and face-to-face -face visit and communications so we can learn from each other and share our experiences and useful cases to make more proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gu. I would like to ask the participants if they have anything to, any questions to pose to our panelists or any comments to make? Anyone, please? I have studied in Japan, so I have some understanding about the Japanese agriculture. And I have two researchers in China with my Japanese teams. And I have taken part in the rural construction work. So the rural construction in Japan and in Korea are all my concerned topics, and I want to have some more statements about this. I think we can have some rankings according to the different, uh, different situations in different countries. Sorry, not rankings, the terms of rural areas. Actually, the concept of re rural reconstruction, if I understand it correctly, is not very well understood in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is a region that has been dominated by commodity cash crops for many, many years. And large plantations dominate, mainly palm oil. So if Margaret, Professor Margaret said, you cannot eat a cell phone, in Southeast Asia, you cannot eat palm oil. Uh, that said, uh, rice production in Indonesia is pretty amazing. 
uh, but it's in decline in many, many other countries. Uh, also, much of it is very commercially, I mean, not commercially, but it's very industrial uh, focused. A lot of fertilizers, it's not organic production. So in organic production, it is very, very low. So my question to all the panelists, if you look at agriculture as a sector, it has always, industrial agriculture has been heavily, heavily subsidized by government policy. But you have your, in your projects, your, your experiences have managed to push against this industrial agriculture. And you have built agro, uh, very organic, uh, shall we say for better words, experiments in your villages, in your, in your work. What you, I think Ms. Mr. Ju Hyongro, you said you needed for many years, for nearly 10 years, you needed friendly subsidies to help you survive. Now, if, somebody in say in another part of asia was going to set up an organic farm i've heard many many suggestions you need to invest in people you need to have education you need to attract young people you need subsidies you need markets what is it that is most crucial that allowed your experiment or your experience to to, to to bloom, yeah, to grow. That's, you know, this is my question. If you look back at your many years involvement in these organic farms, in rural reconstruction, what is it that was the key for your project? What was key? And in the case of, that made it succeed and didn't collapse. Anyone in our panelists can, begin. I would like to hear because I, I'm not so sure if it is the same all around or different. And it would be good to share your experience. In organic agricultural methods, I do not receive quite a lot subsidies. In recent years, the Japanese government have a green strategy policy which subsidized the uh, organic agricultures. It hopes that one quarter of the agriculture will become organic in the next few years. And it is also part of the smart agriculture mentioned by Ono Kazuki. However, there are many problems in this policy. Sure, it will increase the subsidies in organic agriculture, but I don't think we should depend on the government. First, in agriculture products, we make the food for people to eat. This is the first thing in agriculture. In Japan, we have a consumer association and it provides a safe food guarantee for the urban people. The food that were sold there are more expensive than other food, but it is safer. If we can promote this knowledge to more people, then the organic agriculture will also be promoted. And more young people will part participate in this uh, food production. I don't have high hope for the government. I think the efforts of the citizens in rural and urban areas 
and the farmers, the consumers are vital. We need to uniform our ideas and thinkings. I actually have a question. Can I ask my question? Yes, yes. I want to ask a question to the Korean speakers. A few years ago, the Korean government had talked about the development of organic agriculture. The government will give some subsidies to the individuals and the organic agriculture workers to, uh, with the hope to increase the staff in organic agriculture. However, there are still many problems in the selling of organic foods. It has some similarities with our Japanese policies. We have the advantages and disadvantages. So can these policies really be helpful to organic agriculture? Here are my takeaways. And my questions. Okay, I'll take the question first. Since our government has taken this subsidy policies, they have built a friendship with the farmers and they are uh, working towards smart agriculture and smart farms. So basically the subsidies is an encouragement to the farmers, but in long terms, we cannot depend on the subsidies from the government. If we are over dependent on the subsidies, we won't go very long. It doesn't mean that we should get rid of, of, of the subsidies. It means that the farmers should have a deeper understanding of these subsidies. What's the point of the subsidies? We cannot rely on it solely. We cannot only rely on the government. We should have a clear understanding of these subsidies. In our value, we should have a correct value in the promotion of organic agri agriculture, and we should promote the cooperation between the cooperatives in the organic agriculture and in promoting the relevant strategies. So Korea has always advocated the cooperatives to use this form to strengthen the organic agriculture, especially in the micro, biology, technology, and the uh, keeping of the livestock, the processing of their wastes. And these projects are all about the organic agriculture. And I have some uh, ad ad compliments. The organic agriculture in Japan has started in 1972. Back then, the cooperatives of Japanese rural areas and urban areas have cooperated to promote the organic methods and the consumer associations and the rural communities work together to promote the organic farming methods. So we have been through three decades of this practice. So how far can we go with this cooperative methods? I think the products from 
organic agriculture are much more expensive than other food products. So it do not have a very stable or deep root in the agriculture production in all over the world because of its high cost. And the organic structure, the organic system in the national policy have some roles in our agriculture policy. In my opinion, the organic products is certified by the relevant national bodies. And they will have some marks on the organic products. That is why the national recognition can make sure whether the, the products are organic. But whether this measure can be effective, it is still in question. So many local cooperatives and farmer groups need to communicate and negotiate with the recognition administration of the nation and to discuss whether it is important or efficient and effective to put forward such a measure. And the recognition, the label of organic food should be considered seriously. So from the perspective structure, I think such kind of measure is not that perfect. <clears throat> organic agriculture is a combination of human and nature. It is a fruit of the coexistence between humanity and nature. So only with the help of a label, I think that is not enough and that is not so appropriate. And more and more people have been communicating with the local villages and they, some of them even live there. So the Peasant households do not equal to the number of non-peasant households. So the non-peasant and non-agriculture households account over a half of the total household in rural areas. And their existence is more related to the consumer market. So the 80% of non-agricultural household can be the tool to promote the advantages of organic agricultural products and to popularize the concept of organic agricultural products. I think that is where we can make some breakthrough to build a good circle in our whole society to support the development of organic agriculture development in rural areas. Maybe it is a good foundation and a guarantee for further development. What's more, in 1990, South Korea issued our environmental law. And after that, we issued a lot of environmental protection measures and most of them are still working today. So in terms of environmental protection, we have been supported by our state in all special administrative regions in South Korea. And in the region where I live in, we also have eco-friendly policies 
and environmentally friendly policies and the campaigns. So if you have been registered as a organic product producer, then you can never be returned to a non-organic production manufacturer. So the peasants needs to consider this problem seriously. The government had launched a direct payment measure to support the organic agriculture producers instead of forcing them to change their direction. So it is a preferential policy issued by the government. So that is my response to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dr. Gu. There is a question here, and actually we can group some questions. So I would like to ask a question for all the speakers. All of you are working on organic agriculture and rural regeneration. You share common concerns on food sovereignty, seed sovereignty, and the need to rebuild rural communities. How do you think there can be more collaboration among the farmer communities from Japan, Korea, and China? As well, maybe even the farmer communities in South Asia and Southeast Asia. It is not just a question of sharing techniques, but also a question of how to counter the mainstream political and cultural prejudices against the people of other countries. There's also this issue of countering the, the, the power of big agribusiness, the seed cloning that is going on. Farmers are being given seeds and they are locked into a production process with big business and they don't know about it. Big business is taking patents out on agricultural techniques, seeds, um, fertilizers, pesticides. And how do you counter these narratives? So two questions, how do you counter the political and cultural pre prejudices against people of other countries? And how do you counter big business propaganda narratives? So could you share some positive experiences? Maybe this time we can begin with Mr. Yang and then Margaret, and then we come back to the others. Thank you, thank you very much. Previously, we emphasize the technical exchange actually for example, how to conduct organic agriculture, how to appeal for people's love of the land, of rural areas. That is what we are doing right now in the past two decades. In many countries of Asia, including South Korea, Thailand, and Japan, we did a lot of technical communication and exchange. We also invited participants and practitioners to come to China for further communication and the training sessions in terms of agricultural education targeted towards our young people who are willing to go back to the countryside. This work has always been our mission. And we also learn a lot from the experience gained by patents from South Korea and Japan in terms of organic agriculture. But what, what I want to point out is that in the whole process, I'd like to offer some of my insights. Certainly we wish more and more technical exchanges, but all our practice actions, especially when we are talking about organic agriculture, our thoughts, 
are confined within a framework of capitalism, especially the society dominated by finance and capitalism. Our actions, our thoughts, and our fights are also controlled by capitalism invisibly, such as the organic foods we just mentioned. We rely on a higher prices for organic produce to show its value. We try to increase the income of peasants to improve their livelihood. But actually, food itself still is defined within the framework of capitalism. It is still considered as an article. In selling those organic produce, we still rely on many commercial principles. So to some extent, we are still safeguarding the consumerism and the capitalism. In the pursuit of health, organic products and expensive products is also one of the category of capitalism. This is also our confusion. Additionally, our environment today is quite broad. If we learn some techniques of organic production, we can not solve the environmental problems as well. We are facing an extreme society dominated by financial capitalism, especially in the financial world and in the economy, such as the regional conflicts, wars, social unrest. Most of them are aroused or incited by the financial capitalism. The financial cap capitalism is trying to push the flow of capital to make money, just as mentioned by Professor Jade Margaret during COVID-19, millions of people died. However, in this whole process, many multinational pharmaceutical companies made a lot of profits in the midst of such a disaster. The disaster is an opportunity to make money for those capital companies. We are calling for trading equality. We are calling for peace, but for those consultants, they do not want peace. They want unrest to make money. Just as mentioned by Professor J.D. Margaret, we can resort to the local assistance, the TCM medicine, the medicine soup, to fight against COVID-19, but they do not choose to use this way to combat the disease. And the many buzzwords today like AI, virtual economy, e-commerce, and the metaverse, all of these words are kind of methods to exploit the social value for further development space. So just as what I mentioned in the morning, all our participants in rural regeneration, we are facing the same obstacles. Most of us, most of our rural regeneration practice are still confined within the framework of capitalism. Few of them are non-capitalism practice. And then we lack a challenge to fight against capitalism. We should say no to capitalism. And our rural work and the rural building, rural regeneration work should run away from capitalism. We should seek for some development opportunities that is of no use for capitalism. Maybe in those areas, we can have no more niche market for further development. The poor certainly are lack of money. But in this condition, if they can produce something on their own with the help of their community and do not rely on price, 
market and capitalism, then therefore they can succeed as well. So I think in this whole process, we can gain some more experience to bolster our strength to challenge capitalism. So generally, I have two points of view. First, we need to promote the technologies, the concept of eco agriculture, but we shouldn't be confined within this box because those kinds of methods are limited. Without capitalism, those methods may not work. So this is my view. Thank you very much. Mm. I would say that now uh, uh, East Asia is the under the threat of war. And because uh, what we see, uh, what we saw in uh, Ukraine war, and there's a potential uh, proxy war in uh, East Asia. That means the um, Taiwan and um, Taiwan, China, right? And, and, and China, of course, uh, we are all the neighbors areas. So um, how can we um, avoid our peasant do not uh, turn to be soldiers. You know that in history, in the war, those soldiers actually come from the countryside. And uh, we hurt each other. And we are both the, um, the um, uh, victims and also the actors of uh, violence, uh, war the violence. So um, how can we uh, to, uh, to um, don't let our peasant be uh, soldiers? Um, I think this is the very, very uh, important um, questions. That means uh, we 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 uh, pursue peace. That means uh, we let our the majority uh, don't solve the solution uh, or the solve the so called the crisis of capitalism through the war first. And also, how can we? Um, well, uh, revisit or revival our the uh, traditions because uh, we we have the idea of the uh, da tong. Uh, I would say that is a uh, um com there's many interpretation, but in in that uh, da tong shijie, that means uh, we can uh, enjoy the uh, uh, prosperity and together. So um, that kind of togetherness uh, should um to learn from the uh, lesson, from the history. And uh, also, how can we uh, to uh, go beyond our um, boundaries uh, to uh, look into the uh, issues? Actually, uh, for example, like the uh, Fukushima, uh, Fukushima, the uh, wastewater issues, and also the issues of comfort uh, women, yeah. And, uh, Korean and also Chinese, we also have this issue of comfort women, and also the victims of the uh, uh, the uh, nuclear bombs in Japan, right? So we are involved in war. We are both the uh, the actor of victims of war. So uh, how can we? This is uh, the um, the uh, challenging and also the uh, challenging task and also the mission. How can we avoid ourselves involved in this kind of uh, the uh, maybe uh, the potential proxy war? So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, would Ms. Higita, uh, Mr. Ju, and Dr. Gu, would you like to comment on the question? How would you use, how would you, you know, from your own experience of your organic uh, agriculture, rural regeneration, food sovereignty, feed sovereignty, rebuilding communities, rural communities, how would you, overcome the political and cultural prejudices against people of other countries. Um, perhaps the question here is asking, you know, in, in, in history, East Asia has, has had an experience of, of, of colonizing, of uh, perhaps discriminating against uh, other parts of Asia. Um, would you be able to comment how you can promote your your ideas to the South without people in the South uh, being afraid of what you are trying to do. Also the question of how do you overcome big business, the, the propaganda and the, and the effort of big business to control agriculture. Okay, I don't have exact answers, but here are my thinkings about this question. 
the wars launched by the countries are similar in some sense. Some countries are self-sufficient and some countries are import or export dependent. So there will be many conflicts and some movements in the rural areas. So we have many similarities in terms of these problems. So what we should think about is how should we resolve these problems in specific regions? We cannot only talk about scale in agriculture. We need to do it in a scientific way, like the construction of smart farms this is very ideal. We cannot blindly pursue the scale. The flow of the capitals also influence the construction. We do not have uh, the perfect response against the capitalism. Their invention and their impact for example, in Japan, we have built many post-war rural businesses. And after the war, Korea uh, enters an automatic agriculture era. So it's not a competition of scale. but the productivity, the research and development, the liquidity in the specific regions. We need to form a mechanism. When it comes to organic agriculture, we have some misunderstandings in the market sales. For example, in Quebec, in Canada, and other regions, they built cooperatives, promote organic agriculture in a sustainable way. And they have been supported by relevant policies. And they also promote sustainable agricultural methods in terms of the foreign relations with other countries. So how can we build this economic system and mechanism? We should take root in our national conditions and characteristics to find the system that suits our situation. This is my advice. Thank you, Dr. Gu. Mr. Zhu, would you like to add something? Here are my takeaways. Korea has experienced many viruses like the SARS, like the COVID. We have been through a lot. During the pandemic, we put up our masks. And from now on, We are now faced with the agricultural problems. 
the Ministry of Agriculture, they should take the responsibility and solve the problems through means like education, the training for a proper value. So the agriculture problem it should not be solved solely by the farmer. We need the support and the solutions from the government and the ministry. We need to come out with proper solutions together. We cannot solely rely on the farmers to solve the problems by themselves. We should help people build a proper value in agriculture when they receive their education in the schools. This is very important. And to solve those problems, the countries should work together regularly to have more exchanges and visits. We should enhance our cooperation in this area. Thank you, Mr. Zhu. Ms. Hikita, would you like to comment? There's one thing I want to say. Just like Ono just said, the self-sufficiency rate in Japan is only 8%, it's quite low. And we rely on the import of soybeans, the corn from the United States. We rely on United States. And our raw materials for bread is also dependent on the United States. And these products, are produced through some genome technologies. They are GMO products. The Japanese government has many limits against GMO products due to the pressure from its people. For example, there, there are the GMO wheats, which contain some bad hormones and many other products like this. So we need to have some restrictions. And now we are raising the bar for GMO products. And we have many negotiations with companies like Bayer in Germany. And now we are reducing the relevant reports on the GMO products at the government level. The government are choosing what we eat. So for us, especially for youngsters, we must realize what we are consuming, what we are eating. And groups and organizations like us should spread the knowledge about food safety. Are we eating the safe food? And just like Ono mentioned, the rural population in Japan is very small now. Not only the population in agriculture, the whole population in Japan is decreasing. So in such an environment, we do need foreign laborers to help us in agriculture.
Some regions in Japan are not very friendly to these foreign labors. For example, in my city, three decades ago, the female laborers from China or uh, Philippines get married with Japanese farmers to stay in my city. And there are many discriminations on them and some people are not friendly to them. I used to teach Japanese. And I understand that there are many people who are not satisfied about this phenomenon. They have discriminations against these foreign labors. And we hope that we can have an equal attitude to all the people. I hope we can love all the people, love our land and love agriculture. We, we hope for such an environment. That's my response. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Higita. A very, very, very good response. Thank you. I have a question to take, to, to suggest to all the, to pose to the, the panelists. We have heard today a lot of discussion on policy that organic farming, uh, rural reconstruction really requires government assistance, government policy. And government policy, not only in agriculture, but it also includes education policy, wages policy, labor policies, consumer food policies, uh, health policies, and even economic and industrial policies. Now, the, the, in many, many countries of the South, our governments are not friendly to farmers. In fact, there are many governments that are anti-small farmers because they are pro-big plantations. Many governments look at small farmers as being troublesome because they control land and often that land is required by industry. So my question to all of us here, even as we have our own projects, our own uh, enterprises in organic agriculture. The question is this, how do we influence government policy, especially if government policy is not friendly to farmers? Worse still when it is organic farmers. I think uh, because I'm a, a, a university teacher and researchers in the uh, academia, so uh, I think um, the first uh, first priority should be produce uh, this um, uh, knowledge or to change the um, new liberal uh, knowledge system. That means uh, we uh, our research is based on stability and to uh, to promote this uh, um, ecological agriculture. And also we also have already have uh, 20, over twenty years uh, practice in about the uh, rural reconstruction movement. So nowadays uh, we try to uh, turn our the uh, variable experience into the, uh, how I say, do uh, written text or paper or publications, and also to teach our student with our own, um, I mean, the this kind of uh, um, the uh, publications. So um, what we learn is based on the reality. So this is our uh, principles. And also to uh, uh, organize many the uh, opportunities to let the students to go to the countryside to uh, do the home visits and also to research and also uh, work on the farm and also organize many uh, uh, organize many uh, the activities. So we have uh, experience in uh, Chongqing, in Ping, in, in Fujian, in uh, Beijing. So, um, and also uh, uh, also to have, also have this kind of uh, networking and let the student uh, learn from each other. And also uh, we, um, and this um, this come uh, this uh, semester, we also have friends from uh, Brazil, Maisa, 
and she's doing her PhD about the um, um, MST and the Brazil uh, landless workers movement. And so uh, he also, she also can bring the experience in Brazil to our uh, students uh, here in Hong Kong and also mainland China. So I think uh, uh, we uh, as an organic intellectual, so we try to uh, make use of the uh, intellectual resources or university resources to uh, provide the opportunities for the young generation uh, to meet each other, to talk with each other, and to understand each other. So um, in that sense, they um, based on this face-to-face -face and very um, uh, practical uh, engagement, and then I hope they can uh, change their mind and also to um, uh, facilitate the next um, exchanges. So um, this is the uh, what we have done now. Thank you. And of Thank course, uh, based on this, uh, we also to persuade uh, to another from another. That means uh, we also talk about the uh, below, right? From below. So um, at least uh, we produce some good uh, solid research. And then that means we can have some uh, intellectual weapons to persuade government, to persuade our colleagues, to persuade our students. Um, yeah, so uh, research is also a kind of powerful uh, weapon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Very good. Uh, Mr. Yan, would you like to say something on that? How do you influence government policy? Of course, the government policies have huge impact in our work. And we also want to have some influence to the policies. In China, at many, we conduct our work at many levels. including the technologies, the change of thoughts. And at the same time, our team is also working on the participation of policy making. We have engagements with the policymakers or the researchers who can have direct advice to the government policies. And we also have many pilot zones, many experiments. And many projects in universities or from the government. We hope this can have some influence to the policy. To better promote the rural construction and for the betterment of all. However, as I have said several times today, our work today focuses more on the rights of living for the ordinary people in rural areas. We want to foster the, their ability in doing so. From the level of the government, their decisions are to respond the international condition and our state level decisions are more influenced by the international policies, the international community, the financial capital. So I think in this way, many policies may fail to consider the real needs of the ordinary people of the nation due to the huge impact of the international finance and politics. So I think what we should focus right now is to break through the framework of capitalism and do the new thinking. And as far as I know, in many countries, especially those small and underdeveloped countries, their governments are controlled by capitalism and many multinationals. So those countries are closely correlated to the role of capitalism. 
So I have to emphasize that we need to consider less on the international community. And we shouldn't rely too much on the policies. All we should do is to rely on our local resources to build a solid community, to build the capability of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. The external pressure, the changes of policies, and the transformations of the international community shouldn't influence our work. Our base should always be the local condition rather than the external influence. And we can never totally rely on the national policy to fully improve ourselves. All we can do is to focus on our own scenario. Thank you, Mr. Yan. Excellent. Ms. Hikita. People always say that we have lost our past three decades because of the party governance, economically speaking and socially speaking, we have been deteriorating and we lost a lot, especially just as has been mentioned by our professor, the political transformation and the amendment of the constitution all changed our scenario and our defense army can misuse their power to abuse the production. I think all people should stand together to say no to wars and conflicts. This kind of movement is necessary. These movements should win more efforts and support. We should stand firmly against those violence. The solidarity among citizens and farmers is important as well. We should join hand in hand to support the favorable election. And we should also encourage those who quit their city life to come back to the countryside. And we should remind them the true reality of countryside. It is not that optimistic and not that beautiful. The rural life is quite tough. And difficult. The rural people of Japan are very innocent. And so in those areas, we should say no to all evil things and we should safeguard the rights of our patents. Peasants are important in Japan, so we should care about them. Thank you. Yes, it's very true. And the rural life is very tough, which makes a lot of young people run away because they love the air condition of our city. Dr. Gu, would you like to comment on how do we influence policy? Well, let me say, in South Korea, we have a different story. The separation, the division is our reality. The democracy has a lot of say here. So So I have to say that in the condition of division, South Korea is definitely influenced by politics. And we are forced 
to take some actions to stand against the northern part of the peninsula. So some farmers are registered without too much material guarantee. Therefore, we need to build a solid economic foundation to support the expansion and development of organic agriculture. So in my opinion, the organic agriculture should also be extended to the agricultural industry in North Korea. They should be influenced as well. And they should also develop their organic agriculture. So for the autonomous regions, we take some democratic poll to elect our leader. That is the election system and the rule of democracy. So even though we have ideological differences between the southern and the northern part of the peninsula, but in terms of food, there shouldn't be any difference between the two parts of our peninsula. We should be in pursuit of the same goal. So to develop a more peaceful area, to foster a peaceful relationship between the southern and northern part of Korea, we can make organic agriculture as our breakthrough to better develop our bilateral relationship. And we can also let the governors to recognize the importance of organic agriculture. It matters a lot. Farmers should also join the group of citizens to promote the concept of organic agriculture. Nationally speaking, they want a division, but for the grassroots public, we do not want such a division. So some grassroots organization can launch our movements to de-escalate the confrontation status between the southern and the northern part of peninsula Therefore, we can foster a stable and peaceful development within this area. And maybe in this process, we can have some unexpected fruits. We may have some other success. In South Korea, we have many examples. We should think more for our patents and that we should solve these problems in the form of grassroots organizations. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the panelists for excellent, excellent uh, presentations, comments, ideas, and sharings. If I have anything to say after today's conversation with all of you, it's that we need to share our experiences more widely across countries, across uh, ethnicities, across cultures. Um, we are up against huge forces, not only the huge forces of international finance, big businesses, uh, geopolitical military uh, tensions, but also the, the challenges posed by our own internal prejudices of our own society. And we really need, if we want to be uh, organic intellectuals reaching across, breaking barriers, building a new uh, agricultural system, building a new world, in fact, uh, we need to challenge and we need to continue our work in our areas. We should not wait for other people, we should just do it ourselves. So uh, I hope all the participants in today's webinar 
uh, don't wait for the South-South uh, forum organizers to initiate anything. If you want to learn more, please reach out to our speakers or reach out to other people you know, yourself. Okay? Don't wait for government policy, do it ourselves. Um, make strategic links if we are to succeed, yeah? So that's with that, I would like to return the webinar to uh, Professor Lau and to thank you all for your wonderful contributions. Uh, I have really learned a lot today. I would finally like to thank all the interpreters. You have done a wonderful job. Without you, this sharing would not have happened.